Welcome to Kaleidoscope of Colors. My name is Ed McCall, the CEO of the Oregon Historical Society, and it is my great privilege and honor to welcome you to the opening night of this extraordinary festival. To those OHS members near and far, welcome. To our friends in Canada, the UK, the European continent, Asia, South America, and South Pacific, a special welcome to you. Over the course of the next five Sundays, you'll be treated to beautiful music played on 15 pipe organs from across the country, each with a palette of colors unique to its construction and provenance. But how did we get here? Last fall, I convened a task force of OHS members whose task it was to select instruments which would provide us with a variety of size, builder, geographic region, and age. As you can imagine, this assignment had its challenges. From a preliminary list of over 100 instruments, we paired the list to a current 15. Later this month, you'll get to meet the members of the task force, but I would like to thank them for their Herculean efforts over the past year. Dr. Christopher Marks, Dr. Damon Spritzer, Dr. Michael Diorio, and Dr. soon-to-be Mr. James Keeley. They, along with my executive assistant, Marcia Summers, have worked in tandem to produce what you are about to experience. The OHS has produced a festival program book, which is available for purchase on the OHS website. You may also purchase a downloadable copy or a free abridged version online. No matter your choice, the book is your guide to the instruments in the festival. In the middle of each night's program, be prepared to sing a hymn, which is a tradition at any OHS in-person event, and our thanks to those performers for their selections. We are delighted that you're joining us this evening, and it is my fervent hope that you and your friends will tune in each Sunday for the rest of the month for this inaugural Kaleidoscope of Colors. It is now. It is now my second honor of the night to introduce to you our MC for the festival a man who needs no introduction to pipe organ enthusiasts around the world. The voice of authority, our friend and colleague from the great state of Minnesota, Michael Barone. Thank you, Ed, and welcome to everyone. I'm very glad that you're able to join us for this kaleidoscope of colors, because amongst the joys of Organ Historical Society membership is uh, the annual convention whereby we usually visit some part of the country and explore in depth the instrumental resources of that region. But unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has really squelched such activity over the past two years. But being the resourceful organization the OHS has proven itself to be, by means of technology, we're going to be able to visit a variety of instruments that would not have been accessible during any single convention. And with the online chat opportunities, you can also engage in some of the fellowship for which OHS conventions are famous. Uh, sorry, you'll need to provide your own liquid refreshment, but uh, after all, uh, since I try to imagine a sense of community every week with my Pipe Dreams broadcasts, uh, even though we're spread out all over the country and uh, perhaps the world, I trust that you can use your imagination and create a sense of togetherness that is very much in the OHS tradition. So let's get started. Three instruments today represent the sort of variety and the all-inclusiveness that we sometimes think of as an American characteristic. The 155-rank Quimby pipe organ, completed in 2004 at the First Baptist Church in Jackson, Mississippi, certainly represents the American ideal of expansiveness. And though at less than half the size, the 71-rank Holtkamp organ from 1951 at Battelle Chapel at Yale University with its exposed, architecturally arrayed pipework and crisp, clear voice, certainly reminds us of just how remarkable was the energy and the attitude of the American post-war neoclassical movement, an important transitional and reformative period during which our focus was redirected towards historic traditions. And those very historic traditions themselves are exemplified by the 18 rank Thomas Appleton organ from 1830 which had been forgotten and ignored for so many years and now is a treasured exemplar of how organs were made in the United States early in the 19th century. 
You can read more about all our instruments and enjoy pictures, too, and stop lists with even more detailed information in our festival program book, which if you haven't ordered, well, now's the time. Go online to organhistoricalsociety.org or call 1-833-POSITIVE. That's really 1-833-767-4843. And I'll just add a personal footnote in that I grew up in Kingston, Pennsylvania, just a few miles down the Susquehanna from the little town of Plains, where Thomas Appleton's instrument, which at that point already was a half century old, had been relocated to Sacred Heart Church and eventually languished unused there, nearly invisible. The ceiling of the church had been lowered to reduce heating costs, and most of the organ ended up uh, above the ceiling, the rest of it boarded up or invisible in the attic above. As a child of the Back to Baroque movement in the 50s and 60s, I surely would have been very, very excited to know that an historic tracker action organ was nearby, but uh, no one knew about it. Only by chance in the early 1980s was it discovered nearly intact, identified as an Appleton organ, and through the work of Alan Lofman and Lawrence Libin, was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It was relocated there by Henry Mann and Lawrence Truppiano, and it now stands resplendent on a balcony in the resonant Arms and Armor Gallery, where Paolo Bourdignon, organist and choir master at Manhattan's St. Bartholomew's Church, and a regular player on this little gem, shows it off for us in music both of its period and beyond, this treasured piece of early American organ history built by Thomas Appleton. Welcome to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. My name is Jason Kurdabni, and I'm the curator in charge of the collection of musical instruments here at the museum. Today, you are in for a real treat as we have a special concert featuring an early American instrument recorded for the Organ Historical Society. The pipe organ here at the Met was built by the famed Boston craftsman, Thomas Appleton in 1830. We believe it was first installed in South Church in Hartford, Connecticut, but by the 1880s was moved to the Sacred Heart Church in Plains, Pennsylvania. There, in 1980, it was discovered, neglected, but fortunately in mostly original condition. Arrangements were made with the Met, and in 1982, Larry Truppiano and his team moved the organ from Plains, Pennsylvania and installed it here at the museum. A few years ago, in 2017, the Musical Instrument Collection had another complete renovation, and Larry Truppiano came back again, dismantled the entire organ once more, which gave him the opportunity to do some maintenance and a little bit more restoration work. Now it is installed in its splendor, and it reigns over our beautiful new musical instrument galleries. Today, we've invited our friend, the fantastic organist, Paolo Bordignon, to play the instrument for you. I hope that you enjoy. In 1829, when Felix Mendelssohn was 20, he was on an extended summer trip through the British Isles. During that period, he sketched music for what was to have been played at the wedding of his beloved sister, Fanny, to artist Wilhelm Hensel. 20 days before the wedding, unfortunately, Felix injured his leg in an accident with a light horse-drawn carriage and he was unable to travel to the continent for the wedding and to deliver the piece of music. The bride, herself an accomplished and distinguished composer, wasn't to be without wedding music. She seized the moment and, a few days before the occasion, wrote her own wedding music, including two pieces for organ, her first, and this preludium in F.
Each movement of Felix Mendelssohn's second sonata for organ will feature different colors in this instrument's tonal palette. In the first movement, we'll hear the full organ minus the reeds in the sesquialtera. In the second, the featured swell oboe stop will be accompanied by the great stop diapason and the pedal 16 foot sub bass. The third movement to march is the full organ, including the great trumpet, to which I'll add the sesquialtera for the concluding fugue.
What a delight. Thank you, Paolo Bourdignon. And uh, to think that it was only by great good luck that someone thought this old instrument from 1830 by Thomas Appleton, hidden away and forgotten, uh, might actually have some future value. Thanks to the Organ Clearinghouse, to Larry Trupiano and Henry Mann and the Metropolitan Museum for reminding us that the old can be made and appreciated new again though it is sad to report that this same museum saw fit to dispose of a 1965 Holtkamp organ, formerly in the Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium, instrument built in a style which, as had been the case with the Appleton before it, uh, is apparently no longer fashionable in the moment. But fortunately, other Holtkamp organs do survive, and Walter Holtkamp Sr. still rates as one of the most important energies of the neoclassic movement in the United States. His instruments from mid-century at Syracuse University, St. Paul's Church in Cleveland, St. John's Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota, and the one you're about to hear at Battelle Chapel at Yale University, were considered a breath of fresh air in the aftermath of the sometimes overly opulent organ sounds of the early 20th century. And Holtkamp's bold minimalist design with so much totally exposed pipework in architecturally engaging arrays made clear that this was really something modern, even if, to a degree, those organs attempted to resurrect repertoire from earlier times. Don't forget that uh, these videos will be archived for later viewing at the Organ Historical Society's website. Organhistoricalsociety.com is the address. And if you're so inclined, we do encourage you to make a donation to help to underwrite the expense of these programs. More details about instruments and artists can also be enjoyed in the Festival Program Book, which you can order online, either at organhistoricalsociety.com or by calling 1-833-POSITIF. That's 1-833-767-4843. Well, having introduced the Battelle Chapel organ, let's uh, introduce the director of chapel music at Yale University, Nathaniel Gums, who certainly knows the Holtkamp instrument well and shows it off playing for us one of the variations from the Nettleton Diary, which was commissioned by the OHS from Kurt Knecht. We'll be featuring it throughout these programs. Then we'll be led in a singing of the hymn, Messiah Now Has Come, which maybe won't be quite so exciting an experience for you as when we are all gathered together, but uh, use your imagination and enjoy the organ at Patel Chapel and Nathaniel Gums.
Unique among musical instruments, the pipe organ has a distinctive ability to respond to human emotions with a fullness and presence unmatched by any other instrument. This is why the pipe organ has captured the imagination of young and old for over 2,000 years. Throughout North America, there is a network of skilled craftspeople who ensure that the pipe organ remains a vital and exciting part of music programs across the continent. We are the Associated Pipe Organ Builders of America, or APOBA, and our member firms lead the global pipe organ industry in quality and innovation. Our members offer the highest standards of integrity and quality. We are poised and ready to build you a thrilling musical instrument that will serve for generations to come. Choose passion. Choose quality. Choose craftsmanship. Choose a POBA. For more information or to learn more about the firms that make up a POBA, visit apoba.com. I hope that many of you will join us at the conclusion of tonight's program, and indeed every Sunday night, for an after-party chat in one of our Zoom meeting rooms. There you can meet with other viewers, chat about what you've seen and heard, and say hello. And a special hello to all of our OHS members. Belonging to the OHS is like belonging to a great club, and it's easy to join. You can call us at 1-833-POSITIVE, or find us on our website, which is www.organhistoricalsociety.org. The past two years have been strange for all of us at the OHS. We've postponed not one, but two in-person conventions, which gave rise to this virtual festival. A festival, by the way, which has been produced at considerable expense. And so I invite you, please, to consider donating to the OHS, helping us defray the cost of production. And since you're at home, without the expense of travel, hotel, registration, meals, perhaps a bar tab, a $20 donation per night seems an appropriate request. All donations in any amount are greatly appreciated. On screen, please take note of the various ways you can make this donation. Before we return to the program, I would like to thank all the sponsors across the country who have helped the OHS make this program possible. A complete list of sponsors can be found in the Festival Program book, which is still available for sale. A special word of thanks to our platinum sponsors, Abbott Downing, Quimby Pipe Organs, Laterno Organs, Apoba, and Pazzi Organ Company. And now, back to Michael Barone. Some instruments leave interesting lives. Certainly the story of the Appleton organ heard earlier qualifies in that category. Fortunately, Yale has always thought highly of the Battelle Chapel Holt Camp, since along with the huge Skinner in Woolsey Hall and the Becquerot at Dwight Chapel, the Little Skinner, and the marvelous mean-toned instrument by Taylor and Booty in Marquand Chapel, students at Yale do have a real range of experience at their fingers. At First Baptist Church, though, in Jackson, Mississippi, all of that experience is blended into one grand idea, uh, made even grander by Quimby pipe organs, who actually started off with a failed instrument, half again as large as what's there today, but uh, maximizing tonal efficiency and minimizing unnecessary overindulgence brought about this better organ, which reincorporates and revoices pipe work from the church's previous instruments by Skinner, Moeller, and Casavant, plus some 60 new ranks of materials that Quimby has added, along the way creating an astonishingly flexible organ of more than 9,000 pipes and 155 ranks. It ably fills the 3,000-seat sanctuary and acquits itself in a truly broad spectrum of repertoire, but it's disappointing to report that after so much effort and expense was invested in this instrument, changing worship styles with the use of a string orchestra and a church band have um, put the organ somewhat in the background. But Jan Crable, who is organist at the Community of Christ in Independence, Missouri, and also for the Kaufman Center and Kansas City Symphony, is going to treat us to a varied program of Bach, Sowerby, Gounod, and Jeffrey Wickham 
that surely should touch on this instrument's dynamic and colorful potential. So take it away, Jan. Hello, I'm Jan Craybill, organ conservator at the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts in Kansas City, Missouri, and organist in residence at Community of Christ headquarters in Independence, Missouri. Today, however, you and I are taking a trip to Jackson, Mississippi, where we're here at First Baptist Church, just steps from the Capitol building here in Jackson. And we're going to explore today the Quimby pipe organ that you see here. This is an impressive venue. It seats over 3,000 people, and this organ has 155 ranks, so it makes quite a sound. This organ was dedicated in 2004, has five manuals, as you can see, and 155 ranks, as I said. It's tonally designed in the Anglo-American Romantic Symphonic tradition, but it has some unique characteristics as well, including a continuo division in the Baroque style, and of course, lots of imitative voices in its orchestral division and a very wide range of tonality, so I can go from the softest flute celestes to the crowning glory of the tumba mirabilis. It contains pipes from the church's very first organ, built by E.M. Skinner and Son, and it also contains Cassavant pipes from the York Hotel in Toronto. So in this short program, I hope to show you just some, just a touch of the many voices of this instrument. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy everything from the Baroque to a piece that was composed just a couple of years ago, played on this Quimby pipe organ, Opus 60, installed in 2004. Enjoy!
Paolo Bordigno, Nathaniel Gums, Jan Craybill, thank you so much for your artistry. And that concludes the first night of Kaleidoscope of Colors. Thank you so much for joining us and for sending us a donation or becoming a new member. Join the after party in one of our Zoom rooms and get ready for next week's installment where we travel to Washington State, right here in our backyard of Pennsylvania, and then to the great state of Iowa. Our host next week will be board member Michael Diorio and of course the festival MC Michael Barone. On behalf of all of us at the Oregon Historical Society, thank you for watching and good night.